Welcome to all attendees of this financial real estate webinar. DD Talks have assembled an impressive panel of experts that cover all aspects of the topic while seeing financial real estate through the lens of each and every stakeholder. The fast expansion of the coronavirus worldwide has forced governments to take extensive containment measures, leading to GDP decline in European countries to an extent that we've not seen since 1945. Moreover, we have massive unemployment, wage cuts, air traffic down by at least 80%, borders almost closed, further lockdowns in many countries, the fall in tourism and market uncertainty has all had a specific knock-on effect to a whole host of real estate, particularly that of retail, hospitality and office. Now, over the past couple of years, real estate investments have generated firm cash flow and returns, but the reality has quickly changed. Now, there's a lot of uh, ground to cover during this webinar because of the different challenges and opportunities of the stakeholders, influenced by both the profile of real estate and which side of the financing table you are sitting now, to help us navigate the complexity of real estate finance, please allow me to introduce you to our expert panel. First, we have Dieter Nittel, head of CEE at the Deutsche Vandenbrief Bank. We have Martin Erb, managing director, head of international real estate for continental Europe at Helleber. And we have Philip Fugacic, partner director at Colliers International. And last but not least, we have Jeff Co, general partner and co-founder of Limestone Capital. Now, thank you, gentlemen, for joining this uh, real estate uh, uh, webinar. And uh, yeah, my, my intro was pretty bleak. So um, hopefully we can now lighten up uh, uh, this session with all of the opportunities that that bleakness may bring. Um, so to ease into the topic, maybe I can come to you first, Philip. Um, what has been the COVID-19 impact on the investment market from your perspective? Okay, uh, thank you, Roger. Hello, everybody. So, regarding the impact of uh, COVID-19, so since we all had this shock uh, in, in March, uh, which was characterized by the lockdown and, and uh, after that relatively quiet and easy summer, obviously uh, people felt they need, uh, they need vacation, physical, mental uh, from, uh, from this uh, very new, uh, new thing that all have uh, hit us. So in this sense, investment market uh, was acting uh, in similar way. Uh, transactions which were uh, in progress uh, uh, in pre-COVID, they all stopped. Uh, prolonged, some cancelled. So basically, the uh, until until uh, autumn, uh, it was it was quite quiet. Uh, although investors were uh, were quite um, concentrated and were looking at the at the market uh, all the time. The the biggest ob obstacles, of course, were international travel. Uh, which, as you mentioned, was uh, was hit very hard, and then people had uh, even bans uh, beside difficulties uh, in cross-border movings. So when you come to the some basic stuff, uh, if you are acquiring something, you you are doing due diligence, you are uh, doing the physical inspections, you having meetings. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, very problematic now, and it's not used uh, that we are doing this via Zoom or similar. So um, these are some um, practical obstacles which which were there, uh, together with the uh, overall uncertainty on the on the market where the economy is going. Uh, how hard will this uh, health crisis impact uh, impact the uh, the economy and uh, real estate sector? Um, so. Uh, not surprisingly, 
uh, we witnessed this huge big bid ask spread uh, between expectations of the landlords um, and and uh, sentiment of the of the buyer. Um, I think, uh, of course, now it's at the end, it was all the question of uh, market value and how someone perceives the pricing. Um, so I would even argue that the yields were not so uh, dramatically affected. Uh, I didn't notice, at least for the prime properties, that, uh, that the buyers were adding premiums on um, uh, risk premiums. Uh, thus uh, deducting the uh, or decreasing the market value, uh, but rather uh, showing um, showing uncomfortable with with projected cash flows uh, and how they uh, expect uh, expected to see it in the future. So uh, of course values drop down, uh, bids uh, for the properties were were much lower, as I mentioned, particularly for the. Uh, for the effects on the rental incomes uh, and these negative expectations on it, uh, but less less for the yields. As as we now uh, read more and more, uh, I remember it was discussion whether it was it will be a V-shaped recovery, uh, and uh, now uh, I think we uh, we are closer to K-shaped recovery, meaning that uh, in Throughout real estate, uh, I would uh, I would translate this that uh, prime properties and and uh, uh, good good real estate products uh, will have uh, demand and uh, and uh, strong pricing uh, around it in a range of pre-COVID times, uh, but uh, the one with difficulties, whether if it, if it is for example retail. Uh, hotel sector uh, or some secondary locations uh, or, or some properties which are uh, eff affected uh, from the virus. Uh, in this sense, we will, we will probably see a, a huge drop. What, what particular, particularly maybe uh, afraid me most is uh, that in CE and um, in SE region, um, I'm, I'm sitting in Zagreb, uh, in Croatia, so we are talking about emerging markets. So traditionally, during the crisis, all the capital uh, withdraws to the tier markets, uh, to the domestic uh, big countries, uh, UK, Germany, um, and um, perception of the of the risk for for this region uh, will probably uh, increase. And uh, since money is available, and uh, we with all this monetary uh, stimulus, all the governments and central banks are doing a fiscal stimulus as well. Uh, money is available and there are funds uh, keen to invest uh, today. Um, but uh, probably the pool of potential investors, not probably, but for sure, uh, in this region is weakening and is uh, smaller. Uh, so in this sense, we could speak about lower liquidity on the on the local markets, uh, meaning that uh, certain price decrease uh, might might happen in, in the future. Okay, thank you for that. I think there's a lot of points that we'll be returning to there uh, as we move into uh, in, into the session. But um, if I can come to uh, Martin, what what has been your uh, perspective on the investment market? Yeah, um, so also warm welcome from my side here um, from Frankfurt. Um, I think um, Philip mentioned most of the points. I think what we learned over the last yeah, six months now, eight months now is how vulnerable actually the economy and all the markets were. You know, um, over the last um, uh, yeah, seven, eight years, we were all feeling, uh, nine years probably, we were all feeling a little bit like heroes. Here, yeah, I'm uh, like Superman, you know, nothing can really happen to us. And then all of a sudden, um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, this virus came around the corner. No one expected such kind of an impact. And I think also the investors, all the investors, the banks, all participants, we all learned, mm -hmm. you know, how shaky such kind of, a, of or the markets could be in such kind of a situation. And um, now the question is who can adapt quickly to the new situation and can really, let's say, cope and work with it. 
Um, and the second point for me is, um, you know, over the summer, we all felt a little bit, um, yeah, we're forgetting more or less about the virus. And now we had, well, we are having the second wave, um, which most of our um, scientists uh, uh, were, were actually warning us here. Now we have it. And the question is now, how long will the crisis now continue and how deep will the impact be? And I think at the moment, none of us um, can really foresee um, the, the outcome, the results of it, and probably also how severe the crisis might be, because I think that in 2021, we will have a very, very difficult year. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, there's lots of um, key points to pick up on, uh, on there, and we'll come back to them as we uh, move through the session. Uh, maybe we'll just... Uh, Put that question to Jeff. Um, and what have you seen in the investment market, particularly from that hospitality sector? Um, we obviously, when this uh, first happened, are probably the same as most people, and that was that we had a thought that it could be a you know a severe contraction within three months, and then summer would be here, and things could get back to not necessarily normal, but it might get back to some type of normalcy. Um, obviously. As we've all seen now, that that hasn't happened. Um, so we're all sitting there now, sitting and thinking, okay, is this going to go away? Um, obviously, yes. But as everyone's illustrating, no one knows exactly when, because it's a little bit like, okay, there's a virus uh, that there's, there's the um, vaccine that comes up in January. Let's say that uh, distributed. Let's say that a lot of people have it by Easter, and then, uh, but then what? You know, where, where will the economies be? Where will people's spending power be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, as, a, as a middleman, as you could say, as, a, as an asset manager and an owner, um, I work a lot with LPs. And a lot of LPs, as has been said by everyone so far, uh, still have a lot of money. There's a lot of money in the market and they need to put this money somewhere. So to be very uh, like, uh, to make it even more confusing, I would say as an investor, this is probably the most confusing by far market I've ever seen because it's completely contrary. Because on one hand, you have all the operators and even owners saying, we, we're making no money, this is terrible, but no one needs to sell really because there's a lot of market being, money being pumped into the market and there's, a, there's this, this, this you know, life raft there. So, and, and there's a lot of cheap debt. So if you can get cheap debt, then, you take the cheap debt and why would you sell? So I'm not sure if uh, Philip has the being in this position, but he might be able to tell us more about this, but I, I'm seeing on my side, not many transactions, meaning I'm looking at the same hotels and the same assets that I looked at basically a year ago. There's not much new really. And, and the pricing of these assets isn't really exciting that, you know, so, so as an investor, uh, I'm sitting like probably all my other investor friends on the fence going, where are these great deals? You know, and, uh, and, and, I, and everyone is projecting, you know, but they will come. I mean, Barry Sternlich said last week, you know, that it was going to be middle of next year. And because he usually knows what he's talking about, everyone's going, okay, so let's wait and see. And that actually even creates more the wait and see. And, and, but, no one, but no one knows. So... Uh, <laughs> It's a very, very, very weird market. Well, you're the second person that's mentioned there's a lot of money in the market. And I'm just trying to take some optimism from, from, from the conversation here. Maybe I'll come to uh, Dieter right now and get your perspective. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> also welcome to everyone. Um, I mean, from now from Munich. Um, yeah, I think, I think, I mean, most of the things have been said. Um, I mean, um, I think it's a crisis which came, I mean, all at a sudden out of the blue and no one expected it. Um, similar to the situation we had in 2007 and 2008, where we had then a financial crisis at that time. Also, no one was really prepared for that. Um, and also then, I mean, um, the next step would be that also even some um, countries were in danger. Yeah, where also no one expected that, I mean, countries like Italy would have really uh, difficulties 
and uh, everyone said, okay, what would be uh, the outcome and how it will look like? Right now we are in that situation, but I have to say it's really interesting to see how people and um, um, right now also parties in the market adapting to that situation. Yeah, for example, looking at right now what we are doing here. Normally, I mean, the previous years we always had uh, regular panels. We were traveling. Right now, people are getting. I mean, right now, for example, they have online panels. Uh, a lot of home office is taking place. For example, also on our side, where um, I mean, as a bank, normally, I mean, you know, uh, be present in the office is one of the the, the the main factors. And right now, people get used to it that you are partially in the office, you are partially at home. Uh, and you can be well connected. Yeah? So most of the things you do then online, and I have to say it works really quite well. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And also that's what we see. For example, all the deals we did this year, they, we did them during Corona times where of course, also investors faced the issue that they couldn't travel, but then also at the end of the day, it took a little bit longer, but then we managed, or for example, there was a site visit last week where, I mean, there was someone uh, being uh, on the side, but he did done a video showing it to the others. I mean, and that's how it works these days if you do site visits. And I think um, uh, that crisis and that situation will really have a very, very, I mean, a deep impact on how we do business. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I have to say that uh, I think there will be a, a way through that and people will adopting. And um, and so I'm I'm quite positive about next year. Okay, uh, you mentioned something there: deals. What deals are actually being done and financed? What are you mm -hmm. seeing? Yeah, I mean, in terms of overall deals, I think um, you mentioned it already. I mean, at the moment, um, you're you're concentrating mainly on logistics deals, of course, office deals. But also, I mean, it depends in terms of retail, for example, if it's neighborhood uh, convenience, uh, food anchored or discounters, for example, also that is working um, um, in terms of asset class, I would say. Of course, um, then the, the other factor is definitely, okay, how deep is the market? So normally during, during these uh, times, I mean, Philip mentioned already, of course, um, everyone is looking at, at prime stuff. But of course, yield wise, as you said, for example, if you have just probably a 25, 50 bips uh, a differential to pre-corona, of course, there is, especially on these on the on the prime stuff, I mean, there's a, a lot of fallback possibility that you're that you are hurt then by by a further yield shift. So I think I think also we are looking at some other other stuff where we say okay well probably it needs a further lease up or so and you have higher yields. In terms of markets, I think um, in CE um, we we are looking at um, beside Poland, which of course is the biggest market uh, by far and remains like that. We are also looking at the Czech Republic. And also in terms of activity, you see a lot of is going on, especially in, in Warsaw, yeah, as a capital city. Um, of course, you see also some transactions. Uh, I mean, in the in the region in Poland, but it comes mainly down to the to the capital city. Um, uh, of course, um, uh, if it comes to if we are talking about office, then you have the Czech Republic, Hungary, um, and also we did a couple of deals in Romania. Um, but also there, I mean, very good assets, yeah, very, very prime stuff. Um, but I mean, of course, you face the, the, the country risk of Romania. Uh, but we said, OK, well, it makes sense from the perspective. Also, if you have the best assets uh, you can finance there, then also we are prepared to, to, to finance something in, in Romania. And what's been the average value of these deals? Can you share that with us? Yeah, I mean, that ranges between, let's say, 60 70 million to 200 300 and normally then what we do is then we club for example uh we we did a deal together with martin uh for example in the czech republic uh in prague um because normally then if it comes to um uh, higher loan amounts then normally what we do is then in in century Stadium that we club from the beginning um but so yeah and the minimum size is probably 20 20 30 million of of loan size. 
Okay, I think uh, uh, Dieter has perfectly passed the baton to you, Martin, right now. <laughs> Can you talk about a little bit about the the lending volumes in the specific markets that Dieter's uh, uh, mentioned there, and maybe others that you are uh, part of as well? Okay, I mean, um, as we already mentioned before, and uh, Philip said that uh, um, very well. I mean, the investment volume in all the markets have gone down dramatically. I would say in some of the markets, um, more than fifty percent. So we as the banks, we can only follow our clients, which are the investors. So um, you can say that in most of the markets, the lending volumes have gone down similarly to the investment volumes here. Maybe sometimes you do a refinancing, which is also a new lending volume for the banks, but it's not new for the investor. But I would say um, the lending volume has gone down in some markets, I would say significantly. In countries like Poland, for, exact, for example, not that much because Poland, I think, is, is for me clearly the winner because people are fleeing back into the markets uh, which have higher liquidity. And this obviously is Poland in CE. So um, we are still fine uh, um, from, uh, from Hellaba's side um, with our lending volume in, in CE this year. Here. So, um, but it's definitely lower than it was last year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Philip, uh, you have anything to add to that from what you've seen in, in, in your region? Yeah, I mean, uh, from, from my perspective, I, I would say that uh, banks are, are open to, to finance. It's more about the investors uh, uh, who are not rushing uh, to acquire something uh, with all this uncertainty ahead, uh, particularly in or most difficult, I would say it's uh, with uh, hotels. In Croatia, for example, we have very uh, particular situation uh, where banks uh, gave uh, commercial and development banks uh, uh, who, who are 99% of the lenders uh, of our hotel sector, um, they give moratorium on uh, on um, bank repayment on loan repayments. Uh, so in this sense, uh, landlords, uh, hotel owners are more comfortable and, and are not under pressure. So we, uh, this for sure we prolong some for sale um, and uh, even some discounted sale because uh, landlords still um, are in or pushing the position where, where they expect in a year or two or three uh, business as usual. Uh, I, the recovery of the HDL uh, segment will, will take uh, maybe the longest out of all uh, real estate sectors, uh, but for sure it will not be uh, a year or two to reach uh, 2019. Um, Further, uh, what is different and what Jeff mentioned, I, I, I agree that, uh, or at least I know uh, more transactions which were canceled than closed and very little were closed in, in, this, in this period. Uh, so the volumes uh, drop uh, significantly. Uh, but uh, the difference now is that pre-COVID, it was even hard to find something to acquire. Uh, but now you have a possibility to at least uh, negotiate the, the, the sale. Uh, the pricing is then uh, obviously in most of the cases, the greatest obstacle, uh, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's a different uh, situation from uh, pre-COVID uh, you have offering now. If, yeah, if I, I may mean, jump in here, Roger, so, so, sorry, yeah, let me ahead. jump in here. Um, I, I think what Jeff said is, is what we see is you have a lot of liquidity in the market and um, you still see buyers out there now, um, even putting pressure on the seller um, to close the deal by the end of this year, because um, I think some of them um, really feel that they have now the opportunity, as Philip said, either to acquire the building um, without less competition or without competition here, or mm -hmm. at least um, they see that they can buy some of the buildings at let's say 50 basis points um, cheaper than they would have done before the crisis. And so I think this, this comes together. You have still some kind of call it brave investors here because no one of us knows what the, what the crisis will bring. Maybe they are catching a falling knife 
and maybe you know the yields are, are, are moving now from let's say four and a half to five and next year they will move for another from five to five and a half but we still see investors really closing transactions as long as you have a willing buyer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's stick with the hotel and hospitality sector um, coming to you, Jeff. Uh, I mean, it's well publicized. One of the hardest hit sectors has been hospitality. Um, I just heard today Sir Rocco Forte uh, speaking and he actually stated that he has somewhere in the region of 60 million pound that's just gone out of the window um, during 2020. So there's lots of stories like that. Banks are not exactly open to providing debt finance to this sector. So what are the alternatives for you know, struggling hospitality assets, given that traditional lenders you know, are pulling back? Well, this is probably the area that you're going to see the most movement on next year, um, because as always, when there's a crisis, um, uh, there's going to be a, a large swath of people who uh, need assistance. And when that assistance is not in the obvious place of free money, i.e. the government or uh, the bank where it's cheaper, uh, people go to private debt. So, but with private debt, as we all know, comes uh, high fees, high interest, and a lot of pressure. So most of the people uh, or most of these hoteliers that can't get, for example, this, or I'm going to call it cheap debt, uh, uh, have to get the more expensive debt. And that puts them under pressure that they're betting essentially that this virus will go away um, and that there will be business back at a, a price that they uh, are sustainable again and can finance this more expensive debt. And if they, if they can't, then obviously those debt lenders will uh, essentially take property and then either what they usually do is uh, they unify it into a, a larger portfolio, run it themselves until the prices pick up and sell it again. So what you're actually seeing in a lot of these more stressed markets, because, um, you, know, you know, Germany and Switzerland and Austria, this just doesn't apply. But if you look actually at like, let's take Italy as a prime example, which already had banks under a lot of pressure. Now they're under even more pressure. Then if you own a hotel in Italy, if you don't have a, a large cash supply at the moment, you have to take some private debt. Now, again, I have to be very careful here because a lot of this is, as you can imagine, a lot of this information is like sort of confidential, but there are some very big players at the moment actually, you know, uh, buying up a lot of this uh, debt at the moment in, in these Italian portfolios. And uh, they're, they're the usual suspects. And because they can absolutely, you know, because they're so big, that they can basically buy very, very, very large quantities of these assets. They can just play the waiting game. And if the worst thing that could possibly happen to these guys is they actually end up in a couple of years time with fantastic assets, you know, at nearly, you know, very, very cheap. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's, it's a fantastic space to be in at the moment, the, the debt uh, mezzanine game, if you can. And that's basically where a lot of our LPs are going. I think most of, uh, my LPs actually have a large part of their business now in, uh, you know, private debt lending and uh, only a small amount now in equity because they're a little bit like now is not the time necessarily to do equity. That may be the end of next year or the year after. Right now is more doing debt because we're going to get 10%, 12%, you know, some really good numbers, uh, which you just simply can't get anywhere else. And you're getting it through secure central city locations in, you know, uh, Places which like Rome, which are being destroyed at the moment because there's no one around, but we all know it's going to come back. You know, Rome is Rome. So, um, but you know. Jeff, then one question from my side. I mean, how are the, the, the borrowers servicing the debt, either the bank's debt or the private debt? How do they do that? Because at the moment, the hotels are more or less vacant. You mean how are they getting given the debt? Like who's no, no, who are they servicing? I mean, yeah, I mean, but probably you, you, you they're not that. servicing. That's probably they're that's, not that's, servicing. That's that's, that's the back end. That's the perfect. That's the perfect perfect. That's exactly the point. They're all pushing it. You know, they're they're, they're basically as always put. They're kicking the can down the road, and hoping that this all will go away. And by, for example, the middle of next year, when they have to pay their first instalment and, and interest, that. Mm. The business is back, so it of course it's a uh, it's but, yeah. but it's a little bit like but most of them don't have a choice because it's a little mm. bit like do you go broke now, 
or do you go broke in the six months? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but they're, kind of, yeah they're, they're expecting to lose at the front end and gain at the back end. Yes. yes. Because but that's what they, we, but that's what you need. Yeah. Were great. yeah, but that's what you need. I mean, because you know, having these senior lenders as Martin and I are uh, doing, I mean, that's of course, I mean, that's servicing a, a certain area. But this is, I mean, the, the 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 issue is really, I mean, what you need is really in the in the in the in the debt market, you need much more other alternative solutions, institutions, and and that's what we what you normally don't have in CE. I mean, there was of course the discussion about CMBS. I mean, you know, before financial crisis, but that really never happened. Then, of course, there were certain debt funds, but in terms of their return expectations, also normally. That didn't really work out or they were really in a range where they they lost a lot of money so at the end of the day uh, looking at ce it's mainly dominated still by the by the traditional banks and banking market as it was 20 years ago i would say and that's what you see you see certain banks out there i mean you see for example in in, in poland and czech republic I mean, there are a lot of German banks, then in SEE, there are a lot of Austrian banks, you have local banks, of course, as well. Um, but I mean, it is it is quite a, a quite a stable market and uh, it's not really changing that much. So you're saying that the uh, traditional banks appetite in this market is, um, you know, is less likely, you know, less appealing for, for commercial real estate lending. No, I would say, <clears throat> I would say that, I mean, no, what I said was that, I mean, there are certain banks active in these markets, like, for example, German Landesbanks and, and some, some um, um, uh, listed uh, entities as well as we are, for example, and, but that hasn't changed. So they were active in the last 20 years and they are still active. So they are all Wide. I mean, for example, looking at, at Poland, I mean, the banks who are active at the moment, they were also, most of the banks were active, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. So it's a quite... I think, I think Dieter, I think it, it very much depends which asset class you're talking about. I mean, with Jeff, we were talking about hotels. And I mean, we just agreed that hotels, the hotel sector in general is the, is the worst hit sector of all real estates. Okay. Yeah. Because because you, you usually have short term rents for one, two, or three nights. That's it. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, and uh, if you are talking about um, going away just from hotels, if you're talking about retail, retail also clearly is at the moment not the, the flavor of the month for all the lenders. Yeah. Nevertheless, as Dieter said, if you're coming to very good, good shopping centers, so the prime centers or to the neighborhood centers, food anchored, you know, they will also get their financings and their refinancings. When we come to offices, I don't see any, any big problems with the offices now, because usually you have longer lasting um, lease terms. When it comes to logistics, you can read that now everywhere in the press, logistics assets are clearly the winner. Yeah, so this is mm -hmm. where, the, where, the, where the different asset classes stretch from logistics on the one side, on the good side, to hotels at the moment on the more trouble side. No, yeah. exactly. And, and, and it, what, about, what I was saying so, was that, I mean, for example, I would have hoped that there would be much more debt funds, mezzanine funds being active in CE, filling that gap, which we can't fill. Yeah, so as you said, coming. Martin. I think, hmm? I think they are coming. They, they are coming. It's just, for them, it's just a matter of, of the liquidity in the market. Mm. And, and we agreed on that already in the beginning here of the margin, mm. here of the returns. And I mm. think now in some of the markets, they get much higher returns. As mm. Jeff said, if you are financing a hotel these days, you get much, much higher returns, or you, yeah. at least you expect much higher returns and you hope to find someone paying for that here yeah. um, than you probably had uh, uh, some months ago. I mean, this yeah. belongs to the investor buying the property as well as to the lender or debt fund, you know, um, lending the money to the borrower. Yeah. So I think Martin, this is something we, we all learned. I mean, there are now a lot of opportunities as well. Yeah, Martin, just taking your cue there, because we're talking about asset class. And um, let's just spe speak about them um, in a little bit more detail. And particularly if valuations are really influencing investor sentiment. I mean, you touched on it a little bit there. I mean, we're seeing expected discount rates uh, in retail and hospitality somewhere in the region of 30%. That's what we're seeing anyway. 
10 to 20 percent uh, in the office sector, uh, where residential is, is, is seen to be a little bit more resilient uh, at minimal 5 percent. But Philip, what, what are you seeing in terms of the valuation influence on investor sentiment? Is that, you know, providing a compass and a direction to where the market's going and the type of investors? Well, um, of course, valuations are now uh, most difficult for the, uh, for the hotels. Uh, but I would even argue that retail uh, sector, for me personally, is even less attractive or in more, uh, I would say, long-term problems. Um, actually, what happened now with the uh, retail sector is just accelerating COVID, accelerated uh, processes which were already there. Uh, e-commerce, e-trade, uh, shopping centers being less um, shopping and more entertainment uh, experience, uh, cinema, F&B courts, um, events uh, happening there. So uh, there were um, very ch um, there were challenges and much more work for the shopping center operators to attract the footfall and to keep it uh, attractive. Now with even this uh, COVID now where you are trying to avoid uh, a lot of people and, and, uh, and rushes, so it's, it's, uh, it's getting even, uh, even worse. But the, the shift of the investors from, from the retail and particularly shopping centers uh, to, to logistics primarily started, uh, started a few years ago, uh, maybe two, two, three years ago. Uh, and, and more aggressively, uh, of course, uh, uh, during, during last year. So uh, in, again, in terms of valuations, uh, where the shopping centers uh, stand, uh, I would maybe even have more problems uh, assessing that uh, than hotels. I think the, the hotels is just the questioning when you see 2019 ADRs and occupancies uh, to, to be achieved. Uh, and I'm, I'm a believer in a hotel industry. I, I just uh, think it's the, it's the matter of, of time, uh, but it will be very difficult because uh, the, the air travelers are, uh, are defaulting. So we'll see how this will uh, for first. And surely so, Jeff, Jeff, surely those 30% discount rates are exactly what you're looking for. Well, that, that, that's what I, I was just going to jump in then. So thank you, Andrew. But um, uh, the reality is now is that uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about because it's a completely a whole new subject, and that is the impact on the industry that it will have on the operator side in terms of how operators now will come into a market with leasing agreements versus, you know, sandwich agreements versus, you know, um, just general normal HMAs. And I think that is really not going to take effect for at least another 12 months because everyone's sort of stuck with what they have right now, but everything that's going to move forward from now will bear scars of COVID. I mean, I myself now, when I'm in having a conversation with a brand, you know, it would be normally if you had a prime asset in a prime city, they would be crawling over themselves to give you a guarantee or a lease. Now, of course, they're all just, they're all just like, well, can't do that. I mean, you, are you crazy sort of thing now? It's a little bit like, because, you know, can, can we put a clause in the contract about pandemics? And you're a little bit like, no, you know, because it's, I'm, you know, if you're an owner, you're thinking, no, I, these, this is real now. This isn't something out of a sci-fi movie, you know, it's an actual real, real thing. And so everyone is obviously that, that is one of those effects that is going to take time to materialize in the market. And, uh, but the other thing, sorry, back to you, Philip. Uh, the other thing that I've, we've found is not necessarily a, a price reduction or a price reduction that really is that great, but a willingness to find a interesting working model to, to uh, like uh, invest in something. So a lot of owners now are more open to, you know, like stay in the project partially, and only sell a part of the project, you know, to allow someone else to come in, you know. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot more movement now in terms of, you know, being creative, you know, creative financing models as well. Whereas I was saying before, like debt lenders, even ourselves, where we say, you know what, we'll be a debt lender and an equity owner 
et cetera. Et cetera. You know, it's like there's just become, because of the chaos, there's just become a lot more creativity in the market. And again, uh, how is that going to play out? Because at the moment, people are just looking everywhere and people are getting creative, but, but, but where is that going to take us? Like, and I, I have, this is like one of the very few times in my life where I feel that in the past, I could go, we're in the shit basically, but I can see this is based on history. This is where we're going to come out. But this instance, there isn't that surety. You know, you can't actually say, well, you probably could, you go back to 1918 and go, no vaccine, three years, we'll all become immune by herd immunity. You know, it's like, so, but no one wants to do that. So it's a little bit like, okay, we are in a very new space. We are not sure where we're going. So the most obvious reaction for most investors is risk mitigation, and which is making very, very sure that you're not one of these people who are looked at as being an idiot. And so, yeah, and I'm sure, Philip, you can back me up on, on that in most instances. Well, talking about, you know, risk mitigation, I mean, we've seen some of the really big players with eye-catching debt funds, you know, such as Blackstone with, you know, $8 billion war chest. We've got Starwood Capital that you touched on earlier, uh, Jeff, you know, $6 billion. Chain Capital, that's $500 million uh, in pounds. I mean, what are... What are the investment strategies of sector-specific investors? Maybe I'll come to you, Martin. You mean what, are, what is the strategy of the debt investors yes. of the, of the new yes. funds? Um, I, I mean, I think um, when you're mentioning Blackstone, when you're mentioning um, uh, the other two, I think um, they're clear messages making a lot of money to the investors, to their investors, which at the same time means, you know, um, to which projects do they go? Firstly, they go into big transactions because if you have a fund of 6 billion, it, it doesn't make sense to spend it on 50 million transactions. So they're looking, I would say 100 million, probably two, 300 million a year, probably also in portfolios. And I think um, they are pretty clever because they also have a lot of real estate knowledge from their investor side, which combined with a lot of debt firepower, I think they can do a lot of uh, different projects. Honestly, I haven't seen them uh, firstly in CE, not yet. Maybe Dieter, you have seen them. I haven't here, um, which might be the size and liquidity of the market for them mm. here. Um, I think that they still have a lot of opportunities in markets like certainly in the US. Um, UK certainly is a very attractive market still for them here. Maybe the French market might also be very attractive to them. Mm -hmm. So for them, it's, it's, it's making money, which means, you know, spending the money on, on the, let's say, reasonable transactions with higher returns, um, with properties they would probably later on even take over into their other funds, yeah, or at least they could manage it via their other funds here. Yeah. So I think that's their strategy at the moment. Yeah, no, I agree, Martin. I mean, we have seen them. I mean, in Western Europe, a lot. But I think it's because of the of the of the size of the market. Yeah, I mean, CE. It's a very important market, and we do. I mean, uh, in the bank, uh, a lot of business. Yeah, um, but in comparison to other markets like the UK, France, or Germany, I mean, it's still it's still not. I mean, a very deep market, and that's why I think there are not that many. I mean, first of all, there are not that many banks out there. I mean, there are there are certain banks, uh, but it's not like that you have, for example, 30 or 40 financial institutions as you have, for example, in the UK, yeah, where you have a lot of these brokers and normally you even don't have direct contact to clients. I mean, in CE, it's still a different kind of business. And I think also that's why you don't have uh, these debt funds because you don't have the size. You have it probably in Poland, you have it probably in Warsaw, you have the, the towers right now, which are on the market. Uh, but but, you, as but I you, said, don't, you, don't, you don't need the financing, debt financing no, exactly. uh, an expensive debt finance for the towers because no, exactly. these towers will be because, also financed because, by the other banks. Yeah, and also because, I mean, there is, there is I mean, looking at the, at the uh, what, I mean, in terms of um, uh, the interest rates at the moment and financial costs, yeah, all in rates because the, 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 the funding rates are zero are then probably 200 basis points or so. If you buy something for close to 5%, I mean, you don't need that leverage as you had it, for example, in 2006 or seven, where you asked for, 
I don't know, even 80% leverage at that time. Right now, the regular, the normal leverage uh, we, are, we are granting is probably around 60%, not more. So, and that's, not, of course, I mean, this is exactly the, 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 the deals uh, we would like to do. And we are not requested at the moment to provide a very high leverage. And that's why also debt funds at the moment or mezzanine funds are not, are not uh, um, required or not needed, yeah. A few things that have uh, been already said uh, during the past 30 minutes. One, that there is capital in the markets, uh, but just hasn't really been deployed yet. Um, and a lot of investors are really playing the waiting game. Um, we know there haven't been large scale real estate fire sales at the moment. Um, so big question is, when will the market be the most right for acquisitions? Um, Jeff, when? <laughs> <laughs> I just get your crystal, the last your crystal minutes ball. Telling you, I had no idea. <laughs> um, I mean, my, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I don't think that I know anywhere near as much as Barry Sternlick, but if he says that, and you're not going to share it with us, <laughs> no, 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 exactly. No, but if, if he says next, you know, next summer then um you know there must be a pretty strong reason behind why i'm saying that and everything that i've seen as well looks to be that it probably is the point but i think what is the most realistic outcome is because that the overall markets have increased in their absolute values because of the governments pumping money into them that assets today that we thought were already worth a lot like one million a key there's no reason that that won't be 2 million a key in like five years time. So I think what investors uh, and we have to adjust our minds to is stop thinking that, but everything in five years time is going to be worth what it was in 2019. I think, and that's my optimism speaking, but I think there's a lot of data that backs this up that uh, we are going to not have 2019 numbers in 2025. We're going to have new, better, 2025 numbers. So, so if you're running a business now and you're an investor, you probably need to try and just make sure that you're running an efficient uh, business so that you can really reap the rewards when you uh, are, you know, when when it's rained and the sun's out and you can harvest. And I think everyone just needs to get to 2025 who who may not have the liquidity that these big guys are. And the big guys, as Martin was saying, they just need to find some very big projects and park this money in, let it do some work, and sit back, and in 2025, harvest it, you know what I mean? And uh, so that's that's my only little crystal ball uh, input for now. I can see Philip's but, but, got but, but crystal Roger, ball Roger, what, what, oh, Martin, one point, yeah. I, I, I think what Barry Sternlich is expecting, and I think, um, I mean, he doesn't have a crystal ball either, but I think it's very simple. Um, we will have a time lag here with the economy, with the with all the impacts on the economy, and now here in Germany we have another four weeks of a lockdown. Here, not all the shops, not the shopping centers, as we had in, in in April here, but we have another lockdown, and everything at the moment is postponed into 2021, which means all the 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 impacts on the economy, impacts on the on the on the individual. Uh, companies on the smaller companies here and this will definitely come in 21 so in the mid probably second third quarter I might probably see the worst moment after the crisis provided that we have a vaccination um, uh, hopefully also in the course of next year because otherwise we will see probably the worst in 2020 or 22 here because then we will have uh, uh, probably a soft summer and then we will have the third wave uh, uh, beginning of the next autumn year. So that's why yeah. I also expect that 21 will become a very, very difficult year and a year, a lot of opportunities and chances. Yeah, if we if we have a soft 2021 uh, summer, then all better off. Then I think we're, 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 we're going into completely uncharted depression because, yeah, I think no one is sort of thinking that we're going to have, you know, I, I that's, yeah. The pessimist yeah, view is very pessimistic. So. Thanks for preparing us uh, uh, with that, Martin, just to lighten <laughs> the conversation there. I'm going to go to our farm and just farm now and not do anything else because that's I'm so depressed. Philip, Philip, cheer us up, please. 
Yeah, <laughs> Roger. <laughs> this your question is actually in my job description, and of course, oh, there you go. I have absolutely no idea what to answer. I mean, I know what to answer, but I don't know the answer, right answer. Uh, but no, my, my thinking is, um, is uh, following. Uh, so it was uh, long, not long time ago where you as a landlord, if you sold your property, you had a, a problem because you had a cash. Uh, and uh, I, I think one of the reasons is that uh, not many of the investment products were available on the market, uh, for sure, uh, for sure that. So uh, we are now here in situation, probably during uh, next during next year, uh, uh, some landlords will feel uh, will have uh, much more difficulties and will be forced to react and to do something. So obviously investment uh, market, uh, this will create certain buzz and uh, activity. But I think at, uh, at one point, uh, when this um, uh, health uh, issue uh, will, be, will be clear and we'll know that uh, with either new, new rules, uh, new socialization uh, or, or vaccine or whatever, um, we'll move forward. Uh, whether it maybe we will be uh, not in lockdowns, but more like in Sweden. So, which uh, just to mention uh, a record increase in volumes, investment volumes, which I just read uh, on RCR uh, research. So uh, at one point, uh, this uncertainty uh, will, will become um, much less and sentiment will come. Uh, sentiment that in a year or two will be clear, uh, will be uh, heading up uh, in growth rates of economy and everything. And then the investor will, will start to, uh, to push uh, very hard. Uh, if then will still be the chance to acquire the asset, I'm not sure. If the pricing will then be uh, uh, again uh, tough and stiff, uh, probably yes. So I would bet that uh, investor who uh, who try to catch this moment before sentiment improvement, not all overall GDP and economy, it will take time that this, uh, this reach certain levels, but when the sentiment and trends turns around and becomes more clear, uh, then uh, I think it will be a different, uh, a different position on the investment market. It's not the, the answer when exact, but uh, <laughs> uh, follow <laughs> and watch the market and you'll know. Well, dear, that, that's prime data to give us that answer right now. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, the only thing what, what I can say is, I mean, of course, banks, I mean, what we are doing is, I mean, we really try to stabilize the market. Yeah, that investors have the capacity and the firepower to do something. And that's what we try to do. So what we what we want to avoid is that there are any fire sales. Um, and that's why we are working with our clients. We are trying to find solutions. We are waiving amortization. We are discussing covenant structures and so on. And that's why you haven't seen this in 2008. I think we, we got a lot of calls at that time and people were asking and also investors were asking, okay, when are you selling or, or, or when are you taking over uh, assets and, and so on? But that didn't happen at that time. And I think also it will not happen this time. And I think that's the most important thing also for the overall market and the situation that you have a, a functioning market. And that's why, I mean, I think already at the moment you see certain transactions happening. Yeah. And uh, there are certain investors uh, being active. For example, they are helping developers taking 50% in a transaction for, for an, an interesting yield, for example. You haven't seen this a couple of years ago where everyone said, okay, also developers said, okay, no, now is the time for selling. Right now they are taking investors on board, for example, um, or other, other alternatives. So I think right now, I mean, it's the right time to, to, to uh, and I would, as an investor, I would buy now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good news. That's good. That's good. Jeff, you spoke uh, a little bit about management agreements, um, HMAs, how they possibly will be reshaped um, uh, in the future marketplace. 
Now, something that will be changing, I'm sure, in all lease agreements is the force majeure clause, which is seemingly to take, taking on a, you know, a new relevance in agreements um, and have utmost prominence. Uh, with the force majeure clause now, who's going to really own the risk? Thanks. <laughs> I, was, I, I want that. That's all. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. But that was a desire. No. I, I, I would say from from because of the, again we're primarily an asset manager owner, but um, because we also actually do operate as well, um, we are being uh, we are being pressured the most by the ultimate. Uh, first lien, which is the banks. So it's basically the banks that are the ones who are saying, you know, you need to have some type of, uh, you know, there needs to be some type of guarantee here because we are going to help you, the owner, you know, create something or buy something or operate mm -hmm. something. So, so the banks really are saying to us constantly, come on, you know, there needs to be some type of um, guarantee. But as always with these guarantees and leases, you've seen this now with COVID, there's a lot of people who have actually walked away from it. I mean, there's, there's so many, you know, examples of that so uh your answer is basically um uh, the the, the theor theoretic answer would be that the uh the, the the uh operator still needs to be ultimately responsible for that um it's just again enforcing it um that's going to be the tricky one so anybody else would like to pick up on that comment or um it's too hot it's too hot topic. <laughs> no, no, it, I, I wouldn't say it's not too hot. I mean, uh, the force majeure clause is just a part of the whole transaction here. And uh, as we already discussed here um, now several times is that at the moment, you know, I'm, I'm showing a kind of a, a panic reaction and uh, executing securities, going into foreclosure of a building. I think it, it's not a solution at the moment. The, the solution at the moment is speak with your client, speak with the borrower, find reasonable solution on the properties. Firstly, usually the banks, I mean, we have a buffer between the market value as it was before crisis and our loan amount, the LTV. So maybe the LTV has gone up from 60 to 70, 75. It also depends very much on the cash flow here. If you're in the, in a, in the hotel sector at the moment, if you want to, let's say, uh, foreclose a hotel in, the, uh, uh, at, in these times here, will there be any buyers? And at which price will there be any buyers here? I think this would neither make sense for the banks nor would it make sense for the investors or for the current investor at all here. Because um, you always need a, a willing seller and a willing buyer to get a deal done here. The same more or less applies to the, to, the, to the other asset classes. You have to be reasonable, look at your investors. Maybe the investors can bring some more equity here. Maybe you find another solution. Maybe on the hotel side or retail side, you have the cash trap mechanism, which helps you out here. So I think you really have to see the whole package. And as I just said, the force mature clause, it's just really a small part of it. And I mean, you know, going back to your borough saying, okay, now I stick or we have to stick to the force mature clause because everything is underwater completely. I, I, it doesn't help at all. Yeah, what's the benefit? Exactly. I mean, and it's the same with the, at the moment with business interruption insurance. Yeah, I mean, all the discussions um, clients have with, the, with their insurance companies. And um, so I think force majeure, I mean, actually, we haven't looked at it uh, right now the last six months uh, it, in not one of the cases. So as, as also Martin said, I mean, in, we have a couple of cases where, where we discussed uh, with the client. And I mean, what, the only thing what we can do is we give them time. Yeah, I mean, of course, Jeff, you're, you're saying, okay, well, they are very pushy. Okay, that probably relates to certain uh, deals uh, on the hotel side. But overall, we really tried to, to give uh, our clients time right now to digest. Um, and, uh, and that worked actually very well in the last six months. Right now, of course, as we have uh, new measures coming, um, um, lockdowns, or lockdowns light, we have to see what's the what's the second wave now, what's the impact of that, um, especially on retailers, yeah, as uh, the question is how much uh, uh, financial uh, buffer and liquidity they have. But overall, I think that's, that's what the banks can do. And that's what we all try to do. Yeah, uh, as I said, it's not in our interest right now to, to foreclose or, or anything like that. 
-hmm. We've 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 talked about a lot of doom and gloom uh, on the horizon, unfortunately. Um, in a way that we've danced around that dreaded R word, um, recession. And once COVID passes, hopefully uh, sooner rather than later, what will be the inevitable effect of recession on real estate prices moving forward? Philip? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, <laughs> thank you all for laughing. Um, you're betting on a recession, if I can uh, rephrase your question. Well, there's a lot of people betting on a, uh, on a recession, uh, and a lot of uh, wise investors uh, ultimately look forward to a good recession. Um, I, I'm just you know, really trying to understand from your perspective what you expect the market to be uh, how the market will be influencing real estate pricing. Yeah, I mean, for, first of all, I think the, the governments and, and uh, central banks are doing uh, uh, a lot of just to avoid this negative circle uh, which could uh, come from uh, consumer sentiment, less spending, uh, rising unemployment, uh, which for sure taking all this uh, into account, uh, all, all these macroeconomics will deteriorate and uh, then, then it might be a, a very huge problem. Uh, personally, I, I think or I hope uh, we will avoid this uh, scenario. Uh, if, if such happens, um, uh, I think the, uh, the, the difference and the spread between prime properties on the tier markets and emerging markets and secondary properties, uh, this, this difference will, uh, will just uh, increase. And um, for sales are inevitable, inevitable I, I think, in, in, that, uh, in that sense. Um, on the other side, on the other side, I think, um, I think we will see, uh, we will see, especially in real estate, we'll, with, uh, which have for longer leases and uh, unexpired lease terms. Uh, I think this will help to overcome this, um, uh, this period. And uh, uh, so sectors like logistics and office, I think uh, it will, uh, will handle that uh, better. Uh, then, of course, hotel, which, uh, which have daily rates uh, at the end. Uh, of course, there are other options uh, with lease agreements. But uh, for sure, uh, I think it will, it will depend on the niche and on the sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would actually this... add that, if, if I can, with that, because... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. It's so important, because I actually come from the technology uh, world before I got into this. And... Most of my peers and friends are still in the technology space, either as founders or you know, um, investors in technology. And they are actually across the board doing better now than they were pre-COVID. And that's across the board. And uh, th this is an ever-growing market. Uh, more and more people are turning towards technology you know, solutions to, to make their work easier and uh, also even produce products cheaper. So, so there is a whole uh, large demographic here who are making more money now and will be making more money in the future, as also, again, as I keep saying, the market's pumped full of money and that these people will want to spend that money. So uh, there's nothing wrong with the hotel industry except for the fact that the government is telling people they're not allowed to travel. Because if the government wasn't saying people weren't allowed to travel, the hotel industry would be doing better this year than they were last year. So as soon as the governments let travel again, and as soon as these hotels are able to continue being a, a uh, offering a solution to these people from, for example, just the technology field to go and spend a holiday, they will start making a lot of money again. So again, like always, it's just a matter of when and what if, and we're just trying to guess. And, and Martin is more pessimistic than me. I think it's sooner. Uh, he thinks it's later, but otherwise we still, I think, all agree that it's going to, it will come back. And I think properties will be worth that much more. And so my ultimate positive message mm. is that, yeah, there's, uh, it will get there in the end if you can survive. So button down the hatches, get through this and we'll be fine. 
survive, survive. I mean, the one hour has passed very, very quickly. Um, and I'm sure we could uh, run on and on and on with this session. Um, but I have one more question to each of you um, uh, with the intention of trying to uh, finish on a high. Um, um, and that's really a famous quote from Jack Welch was never miss out on an opportunity like a good recession. We've just spoken about recession and we've spoken a lot of capital in the markets. There's a lot of great opportunities. This therefore is building to be quite a, a vintage year for real estate finance, whether it's 2020 or 2021. So a question to each of you, where are those opportunities? Where are those nuggets of gold? Martin. Oh, that's, it's, it's a good question, um, or a, a difficult one as well. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm still a little bit pessimistic um, uh, um, because, you know, it, it, Germany, you say, never catch a falling knife. You know, I mean, when should you buy at the beginning of the recession or at the end of the recession? And probably it's better to buy at the end of the recession here. So um, recession has, let's say, I think officially started, at least here in Germany. If you look at the German economy here, I think it's two or three quarters of falling economy. We had that. Um, the question, I mean, we were expecting um, a recovery in the fourth quarter, actually, and now in, in Q1, 21. But uh, with all the, uh, the, the, the mini lockdowns as we have them, um, now in November, I'm not sure if we have seen the worst yet here. So um, that's why I think um, there will be opportunities, but we all know if there are opportunities, someone has to lose money first, you know, on the buildings as well. It's like uh, a little bit in the casino, someone wins, someone loses here. So there will be losses on the other side as well. And these losses will have an impact probably on us all because our pension funds, insurance companies, they will also make losses here. It's not that we're looking for the winners. We also have to look for the losers here. That's the first thing. Um, so I think um, there might be some always as in, in each time, there are good opportunities here also today. You can also buy good buildings today. If you have a long-term horizon, as Jeff said, um, there's no need to worry because we have always seen uh, um, a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it's just a question, was it after one, two, three or four years here? And how dark was the darkness we have gone through in the past here? Um, I think um, you will have a lot of good opportunities next year, but I'm, I'm more with Barry Sternly saying, I think you will, I'd, I'd rather expect them um, yeah, Q2, Q3 next year. Okay, thank you. Dieter? Well, I mean, nothing, not a lot to add here. I think, I think the, um, I mean, there is a lot of liquidity in the market. Governments are supporting uh, the market, and that's why I think it's the right environment to buy. Um, and even right now, when you would have expected that you have again a complete lockdown right now, they keep everything open uh, because they are saying, okay, well, it is not. Um, to justify right now anymore that you that you have really these hard measures uh, again so that's why i think it's the right time to buy um and of course i mean as most of the people are doing right now if you can um enter in into a nice uh, big deal for probably where you need a lot of liquidity all of these bigger buildings towers or logistics portfolios, for example, I think that's exactly what a lot of people are doing at the moment. And I think that's what you should do now, because I mean, you expected already two years ago that there would be um, a certain um, um, uh, situation where yields would increase. And if you right now have the possibility to acquire a trophy building or a good portfolio, um, I think, then exactly I would do it now, yeah? Because I would expect that next year, um, if you would have a vaccination and I believe in that, I think then you will have the situation by the end of next year that uh, you will have, I mean, much more stability. You have GDP growth again, and then everyone would say, okay, well, why I haven't done anything and I was just waiting. So I would do, but of course, you know, banks, I mean, they always are very conservative um, and uh, that's right now on the investor side, we are there. Yeah, Martin, myself, I mean, we, we have 
uh, the the money to to support them. And so let's see. Yeah, but I'm I'm rather positive for next year. Thank, thank you, Dieter. Philip. Yeah. Uh, for sure, uh, economy will face challenging times now. But I uh, also like probably Dieter believe that. Uh, we will see uh, we will see recovery uh, uh, others better sooner than later. Uh, uh, but uh, in this sense, uh, I think it, it is a good time uh, to invest. Personally, uh, I would uh, look uh, for the sectors in logistics and industrial uh, with all this importance of uh, e-commerce and e-trade, which is uh, taking place. And even with, um, with the production uh, coming closer to Europe from uh, Far East and particularly for China uh, because of uh, this value chain and uh, distribution channels, which uh, become more and more important now. And the fact that basically cost of labor now it's um, getting more equal uh, to, for example, Bulgaria and Romania and, and, and China. So uh, in, in this sense, I, I think this would be the good sectors. Uh, I would also bet uh, for, you know, for hotel, uh, for a hotel, if there will be an opportunity to acquire with certain uh, discount, I think hotels also have some opportunities uh, outside uh, tourism. Uh, we see this in hybrid hotels where uh, hotels are trying to catch, uh, to catch, let's say, office market customers uh, and getting um, and uh, transforming the, the use of a hotel more into, uh, into um, uh, co-working places. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, taking into consideration that this is a very resilient sector and uh, personally we saw, uh, I saw war in, in Croatia and in Yugoslavia, which uh, chased off all the tourists uh, for, for five to 10 years here. Uh, but now, uh, nowadays Croatia again is, is booming and, and uh, being a leading uh, Mediterranean and uh, touristic country. Uh, so, sure. and then for office, I think it's also uh, a good sector because uh, um, uh, effects which are they facing now are, are bet permanent, uh, not permanent. Um, and um, I don't believe that this trend of uh, working from home uh, will somehow become thing that uh, we are not going to office because we don't need it and we don't uh, have it anymore. I, I believe that uh, it will probably um, um, make some changes, bring some changes in terms that one or two times a week people will work from home, especially in in countries like uh, UK where you commute a lot, but in CE, I mean, you are usually 30, 45 minutes to, to your work uh, when you don't have kids on your back, when uh, you have proper equipment and, uh, and everything. So, um, and beside that, it might even uh, come that we will need extra uh, space for offices to, to comply with all the healthy, uh, healthy measures. Uh, and for the retail, uh, I would probably avoid uh, shopping centers, but would be very, um, very positive uh, towards convenient retail, shopping, neighborhood shopping centers or retail parks, um, because uh, they are also a convenient uh, retail, but also have a strong conversion factor where you can maybe transfer, transform them into uh, logistics, especially for last mile logistics. And in this sense, I think there are lots of opportunities. And for the one who have know-how and will be willing to work with, with properties, there will be uh, yields to, uh, uh, to get them. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Well, there's a lot of optimism in that response there. Um, uh, Jeff, you have the final comment, so I don't know if you're going to put cold water on what Philip has just... Uh... Uh, I'll just try and wrap it up quickly, obviously. <laughs> um, but uh, again, I'm only hotels, so that'll be simple. Uh, hotels, for me, the golden nuggets have to be within repositioning because uh, there's a general attitude that uh, a lot of hotel or a lot of hotel guests are looking for a little bit different experience now. Most of those uh, seem to be around wellness and, and well-being uh, and not the big box they're all inclusive, you know, it's sort of, that's the trend. So I think the mega trend is pointing us that way. So for people to be able to maybe even pick up these uh, bigger assets that are positioned incorrectly and change them into a more uh, 
attractive uh, um, asset, then th th that's where you're going to see these double-digit IRRs, I think. So, yep. Absolutely. And that'll hopefully happen uh, next year sometime. So. Wow. Wonderful. Gentlemen, uh, thank you for uh, taking part in this uh, webinar. So thank you to Philip, Dieter, Martin, and Jeff. Also to DD Talks for organizing this event. And most importantly, everyone who has turned into this session. I really do hope everyone stays safe and healthy through these very unusual times. That's goodbye from me. Thank you. Thank you.